Ank Uja Seneb, Life, Vitality, and Health. Thank you for joining me for another talk with Netri Asset tonight. We will be going over um, my app philosophy part eight. And we actually um, are nearing the end of this series. So the next talk um, will be the final talk on this series. And so let's go ahead and jump in and look at the uh, precepts that we have uh, in store for tonight. I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so tonight we will be going over precepts 29 to 35. And like I said, um, we are getting very close to the end. So let's go ahead and jump right in and get started. All right, so precept 29, we have N, which we know by now is no or not. Kenu, which is disorder, confusion, disturbance, disaster, calamity, storm, um, commotion among the elements. And these can be categorized as personifications of set. And set is that um, disagreeable energy that we talked about in the beginning. So if you haven't um, listened to the uh, first Ma'at series talk, please go back and listen to those and they will all help you um help bring you back um, or up to speed with what, where we are today. All right, then we have ah, which is I or me. And so this can be translated as I will not. And of course the goal is always to be able to say I have not, right? I will not cause disorder, confusion, disturbance, disaster, calamity and commotion among the elements. And so it, the end commotion among the elements is of course um, inclusionary. So it's all of these things, but it's interesting that the uh, comedic sages actually included this construct of commotion among the elements. And let's, um, you know, we're gonna look at that as we go forward. And so of course with the um, precepts, I love to talk about how we have the societal um, violation of the precept that ultimately leads to the individual violation. And so this is something that most of us probably have heard of by now, which is HARP. And um, it stands for High Frequency Active Oral um, Research. And so it's basically a weather controlling system. Um, the program was initiated as an ionospheric research program or ionospheric uh, research program jointly funded by the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, the University of Alaska, Fairbanks, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And so um, the HARP, you know, has been <laughs> known for being able to cause commotion among the elements, which is actually in that precept as well. Um, also, another thing that's happening on a societal level is uh, cloud seeding. And a lot of us are familiar with chemtrails and um, you know, there's people who go out and protest against this because they say it's actually um, a detriment to our health and our environment. And so, you know, basically, I just wanted to look at this a little bit and what happens. I was actually curious about the process. So um, it shows that particles, silver particles um, are uh, released, right, by a plane. And I've actually seen this and I've actually took video footage of it. And then the silver iodide uh, particles reach the targeted cloud. The silver iodide aids in the formation of ice crystals. And then the ice crystals become large enough to fall and create snow. And so these aren't normal crystals. I've seen videos of people um, gathering these crystals and lighting 
uh, lighting a flame to them and they would burn like plastic and things like that. So there's definitely um, some negative impact in regards to this that we are not familiar with. And again, this falls under that societal construct of um, creating that commotion amongst the, among the elements. And so we know that on an individual level, we don't want to create disaster and calamity, you know, for in our lives and in the lives of others, but we also want to look at this from a larger perspective. And so I've actually um, seen these man-made storm clouds and living in Texas, which is the NASA home base, I've actually been in one of these and it was kind of scary. Um, it was, I was driving and it was like all of a sudden a, a dark cloud, it was so dark. It just came out of nowhere and it just covered the area and it, and it, it was like these really weird sounds it actually sounded like a hover, like a huge craft was over me. And um, my mom, she lives only a couple of miles away from me. She heard it and felt it where she lived. And then all this rain started falling and these um, he and hell, hell uh, balls. I guess it was hell. I don't know what it was, but it was definitely not um, a, an act of nature. And so these things are definitely happening. And so we have to question these things as well. Um, because apparently they are not in divine order. So ideas and inventions stemming from the minds of set create other problems in an attempt to solve another. And so that's what's happening. You know, people who are not interested in Ma'at, they're creating things and they're creating them from the platform of chaos, right? Which is the opposite of divine order. And so you will, you know, you'll have people that argue, well, cloud seeding, we need it. You know, it's, it helps with global warming. Well, there's other things that can help with global warming that's more natural, like, you know, getting rid of the, the contributors to global warming that are um, capitalistic based, right? But I just wanted to show that, um, you know, there's that argument will always be there. But we know when we look at um, cultures and societies that, really attempted to live in order, in divine order, in alignment with my art. They didn't create these types of things and they had very um, advanced societies. Um, they weren't as advanced as this society, but then we would have to question what advancement means when it is actually leading to the demise of the planet. Is that really advancement? <laughs> so cloud seeding can help to increase the amount of rain um, it's especially helpful in hot and dry regions of our planet. Cloud seeding can be used um, in a rather spontaneous manner. It can be applied in a rather local fashion, may help to optimize crops and, um, you know, and so on. And some of the cons are that um, cloud seeding is based on the use of chemicals. It can lead to soil pollution. And we know that there's other precepts already that we've gone over about pollution. Uh, it contributes to water pollution. Uh, it lowers our air quality. So air pollution leads to acid rain, right? And then we, you know, then what? <laughs> and, you know, the, so there's more. So when we look at that and we want to put it on the scale and weigh which outweighs the other, definitely the cons outweigh the other. And that's because we're not thinking in alignment with my eye. Right, the planet has more water on it than it has land surface. So why would we spend our time and energy doing something like that instead of um, making the salt water right fresh water? I mean, now that's my eye, <laughs> right? And then you can you know water supply water to the whole planet, right? Irrigation all the way to the center of of, of the of the earth, right? Well, the surface of the earth, that is. And so, you know, this, this technology is there. And I've heard that it's supposedly a very um, expensive process. So, uh, you know, it's not often cho cho chosen. But when you think about a mind that's in alignment with my eye, what do you mean it's an expensive process? If the science is there and uh, the knowledge and wisdom is there, why don't we just do it? But if we, but if we're everything is based off of capitalism and how much money can be made, then 
you know, that answers the question. So again, we are trying to get the way that we think in better alignment with my aunt because it just creates um, a more harmonious uh, society for everyone on the planet. All right, precept 30. And asu, which is to judge hastily or hurriedly to attack. A, I. And so this is a simple one. I will not or have not judged hastily or rushed to judgment. And I can speak for myself. Um, you know, this is important to really ponder on and put a filter in place. So when we're watching our thoughts and, you know, that's the prelude to what we say and do, um, this will help remind us, right, not to rush to judgment because we, it don't take, a rocket scientist to tell us that this causes social um, discord. And I like, I wanted to uh, share this. We are good. We are very good lawyers for our own mistakes, right? Which is true, <laughs> we are, but very good judges for the mistakes of others, right? And so we, I know I've been guilty of this. I'm still guilty of it. So this is like one of those precepts that I personally have to continue to work on because a lot of times it's like, oh, if it looks like a goose and it quacks like a goose, it must be a goose, right? That's immature um, thinking. That's allowing the automatic way of thinking to just, uh, you know, continue to do its own thing on autopilot. And so now I, with that filter in place, I am much more slow to judgment and I try to analyze things so that I don't make mistakes. So this precept, is reminding us to take time to reflect, right? Before we pass judgment or come to conclusions about things and people and situations, especially negative ones, right? Because we know that um, according to the National Science um, Foundation, 80% of our thoughts are negative, right? So we wanna fix that and take time to reflect, especially to weed out those negative um, assumptions, right? Um, this precept is teaching us, right, the importance uh, to intuit various purviews and possibilities. Just because it is our purview, right, it's our truth, does not make it the absolute truth. So it's important to give other people the benefit of the doubt and try to see things from their perspective before rushing to judgment. Um, that precept is also um, reminding us to avoid making false accusations, right? <laughs> That's a big one. Um, this causes relationship discord, uh, all, you know, all the time. I've, I've, I've been guilty of it. I've been falsely accused. It's, it's something that no one likes to feel. And so this precept, if we put the filter up for it and we watch ourselves, it will um, help us to avoid creating unnecessary problems in our lives and in the lives of those that we love and care, care for, right? This precept also helps us to avoid attacking other people's character. I mean, you know, this is just like ingrained in us. I mean, I, I, I have to constantly catch myself, right? If, if, if I feel like someone did something wrong, I want to go tell someone else, right? And again, that's a part of rushing to judgment. And I know I have done this so many times where I went and told someone else um, what happened, low key attacking that person's character. Then I go back later on and get the correct understanding. And now I gotta go back to the other person, say I was wrong. And, you know, it, it's like just you know, like spinning, you know, spinning your wheels. And so, again, I know for me, um, work on this precept was really good because it helped uh, me to remember to keep that filter in place. Very simple precept, um, but at the same time, very, very powerful. All right, <sighs> precept 31. We're moving kind of fast this evening, which is okay. These precepts are pretty straightforward, so we don't have to spend a whole lot, a lot of time on them. And, and there's no vowels here, so I'm just gonna say um, simp, simp, 
some, um, I guess I could put the E in there. So then I would say Samet Met, which is eavesdrop. Now, this precept is actually one of those that's often listed as a duplicate. And I, and I talked about this in another talk that as I was working with these precepts, um, I really spent time reflecting and looking at the glyphs and trying to get a better understanding. I mean, we are not in the mental uh, headspace of ancient Kemet, so we have to do our best effort. And so, I mean, I've actually been enjoying it because I haven't really found duplicates. I've actually found alternative meanings and uh, expressions for the ones that's been listed as a duplicate. So this one, I'm gonna uh, show you, there's a, a slight difference here. So everything looks the same. And then you have this glyph here that's not there. And so that glyph is actually the, a door bolt and that um, is, it symbolizes the S. And so it actually changes this word and therefore changes the meaning. So um, I have 17 listed as um, I think I will not pry into matters, right? Prying into matters, um, especially to make mischief, to cause, you know, disturbance. You know how people like to get the, ooh, you know, they want the latest gossip. Oh, girl, what's going on? Oh, what happened? You know, prying into things, trying to get information out of people, you know, just, just to keep things going or just to be nosy. And then this one is it's similar, but it's specifically talking about eavesdropping. Eavesdropping is a little bit different was well, quite different than <laughs> prying into matters, right? Prying into matters is more like, hey, what did he say? What did she say? Which I, I hate when people ask me what someone else said, because <laughs> usually what comes next is mischief problems, right? <laughs> so um, this one is just simply eavesdropping. And, you know, we know that's problematic too. I've, I've caught people eavesdropping on me. I've, I've tried to eavesdrop. And normally what happens is we hear something that wasn't intended for us to hear and it leads to a problem anyway, especially if it was about us. And that's normally why we're trying to eavesdrop, you know, let people talk about us <laughs> behind our back if they want to, you know, trying to hear it doesn't make it any better. And so that precept, that, that slight variation really turns it into this concept of, of sticking your ear in a place where it really shouldn't be. But now we're living in a society where people are doing a lot of things online, right? And so now this precept carries over <laughs> to the technological age that we're in. And um, I wanted to add that, eavesdropping attacks, right? Now we have people that are sitting there eavesdropping on our transmissions and, and still in the data you know, getting that information to um, cause harm. So again, it's so many ways in which these precepts can uh, help us begin to uh, create societies and, and really a way of thinking and a way of living and a way of being that will create less stress and hardship for ourselves and people. Because this person that's eavesdropping here they're up to no good. There's nothing mad about that. And this person, the, the hacker that's eavesdropping, he's definitely up to no good, right? It, definitely looking to cause um, mishap and uh, destruction, right, for someone. <laughs> All right, precept 32. And Ash which is many, much, over much, or numerous. So it's this construct of excessiveness. Chem, voice or words. Ah, I, I, or me. He is uh, on or upon. And then metu or as some people like to say medu, is talking, speaking. It also includes decrees and maxims, right? Um, today, this would also include texting and posting comments, right? <laughs> so again, these precepts, they are, they, they are timeless. <laughs> some of them are timeless. Some of them 
have are outdated and we'll get to that in the uh, last talk. So um, this precept is talking about creating problems, right? As a result of excessively talking. So I will not excessively use my voice on talking, speaking, or pontificating, right? So it's talking also about these maxims and these decrees. You know, you have these people, they want to um, preach all the time and tell you what you shouldn't be doing and, you know, how wrong you are. That's, that's, that's actually included in here, right? So it's going overboard with the decrees and the maxims. You know, it's like me running around with the 42 precepts of my eyes down in the corner <laughs> saying, woe is you if you don't follow these 42 precepts, right? I have enough time keeping my own self in line. I don't have time to pontificate. Um, so I will not over, talk over much, right? Talk too much. We know, we we heard, we all know that, you know, as a child, I used to hear it all the time. Don't talk, you talk too much. Stop talking so much. Stop talking so much. <laughs> and we know that excessive talking and again, typing now. So let me go back because that precept, um, I like the fact that chem is not just voice, right? It's words as well. So however we convey our thoughts and feelings, right? Through communication, through words. And so, um, especially for the young people that are glued to your phones and reading comments and texting and posting, texting and posting, you don't want to, you want, don't want to get caught up in that. You know, you don't, this precept is warning you of problems that, uh, will derive or can potentially derive out of that, right? That's unnecessary chatter. And so here's a few comment proverbs on speech. Speak not too much for men are deaf to the, to the man of many words. And that should be, it says works, but it should be words. And I mean, that's, that's, we know that, right? The person who talks and talks and talks, eventually you don't want to hear them anymore. So it's warning us of that. And especially those who are pontificating and preaching all the time and preaching, people are like, oh, just shut up already. Before all things, guide your speech for a man's ruin lies in his tongue. Right? So that's wanting us to really be um, reflective. Think about what we're going to say before we say it. Don't repeat slander, nor should you listen to it. Right? So it's warning us not even to listen to it because you, if you listen to it, right, or if you eavesdrop in <laughs> or prying into matters to make mischief or just prying into matters, the likelihood of you repeating it is probably likely or slipping up. Just report a thing that has been observed, not something that has been heard secondhand. Right. So it's helping us to understand, like, you know, what's the difference between kind of like gossiping or slandering. Right. If I'm in, if I'm just sharing with someone what happened or what I observed, not speculating or um, falsely accusing. Right. Or jumping to judgment. Those of that other precept, then if that's fine. But we also should understand why we're sharing whatever it is that we're sharing with someone else. Put a bridle on thy tongue, set a guard before thy lips, lest the words of thine own mouth destroy thy peace. For in much speaking cometh repentance, but silence is safety. Right? And again, please, we have to apply this to just communication. Like I said, if we're typing too much and, and sending all these messages, and that is the same thing as, as talking, essentially. The abomination of the sanctuary of the divine is too much talking, right? I think even when I was in Sunday school, there was a, uh, something in the Bible that probably derived from uh, this type of teaching about, um, you know, I think God not liking <laughs> the person, the, you know, a, a, a tongue that speaks too much. So here we have it here. The abomination of the sanctuary of the divine is too much talking. So this is a heavy hitter. And so one of the things that um, can help us with this, because this is a big one, is identifying the basis of our speech, right? Is our speech ma'at or amaat? 
And it's interesting because before work on this precept, I have been just not really wanting to talk a lot. I'm not really a, a major talker anyway. Um, but I've been really kind of like just analyzing why am I, what are we having this conversation for? And this is very important because it's going to help us master that precept. And so from my purview, the top reasons for speaking are to inform, right? This is from my experience and what I've observed working with people, dealing with people, and just being on this planet. Um, to inform, right? To provide needed information. That's a good reason to speak. But then it can also go into gossiping and slander, right? And then we know at that point, now it's on the on my side of the scale. And so again, if we are... Uh, uh, desiring to live in divine alignment and create less uh, stress in our lives, this precept is, is helping us, right? Another top reason for speaking is to inflate the ego, right? This is a big one. Ding, 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 ding. This is bigger probably than the first one in terms of why people are talking today. Um, and what do we mean by inflating the ego? Gloat, uh, gloating, right? Just talking about Oh, I did this, I did that, and this happened, and I, you know, you know we know what gloating is, right? Um, to feel important, right? Fishing for compliments and or validation. Um, to impress, to invoke envy in others. That's a big one, right? How many times, I, I mean, I, this has happened to me, and I'm sure I've done it. You know, you're telling somebody something, and you don't pause to think, well, why am I even saying this, right? And when we, when we do this and we have this honest discussion with ourselves, we're going to see a lot of this stuff coming out, right? Um, we, it's because we want to invoke envy in other people. Um, and then we have the endorphin boost. And so um, according to research that I've come across just um, in my studies, um, when a person is put in a situation where they feel um, some sense of superiority over another person, they actually get um, an endorphin boost. And that is what makes uh, winning feel so good. <laughs> um, so even though there's a bio uh, component to it, we can override that, right? It's also a socially engineered component to it as well. But I just wanted to include that because a lot of times people don't realize that they're kind of like trying to get a little endorphin boost when they are um, opening up their mouth to speak when it's coming from um, this particular reason to inflate the ego. And this is all happening subconsciously. So if you don't really get on top of watching it, you'll miss it. This is happening beneath the surface. Another top reason for speaking <laughs> is to complain. <laughs> um, I'm guilty of this one. This is probably my top reason for speaking, to complain. <laughs> and so <laughs> I've, um, after work on, on this precept, I have really been catching myself because now the filter is is in place. And so I have listened to myself complaining and, and then I'm like, oh my goodness, just stop. No one else wants to hear it. And then I, I have actually apologized to the other person because that's really negative in, energy, you know, that I'm forcing in that person's, um, you know, space. Um, another top reason for speaking, right? And again, this is also including typing and all that other stuff, is to investigate, right? To get in information, gather information, right? Questioning people, prying into matters, right? To be nosy. Um, again, all of these can, um, except inflating the ego, can either be uh, founded upon my ot or on my ot. And so if we are trying to evolve spiritually in this particular area of our life, putting up filters in place to check ourselves and, and, and really ask ourselves and really get down to the reason why we're getting ready to say what we're going to say is going to be very helpful. This is a really big one um, to avoid uncomfortable silence. And I've actually... <laughs> Um, have been in situations really recently, like I said, because I've been really working on this precept. And I, this is real. Like I have seen people just get really weirded out because I'm just being quiet. And then they just start saying things, you know, 
from one of these four, one of these uh, buckets, five buckets, and and I and because I don't really want to get involved, you know, I don't really engage. But you feel the weirdness that happens, and that's because we've been socially engineered to think that silence is weird and awkward. It's like if we are sitting in the room and we're not watching TV or doing something, we better be talking. And that's something that we really want to start working on overcoming if we're going to uh, work on mastering this preset. So we have been socialized to find silence while in the presence of others awkward. Hence, people talk just to avoid the so-called awkward silence. And um, I've actually been enjoying practicing this one. I mean, it's becoming more awkward for me to talk and speak um, on the basis of something I'm not than being silent. So, right, one of the things that we can do is before we open our mouths to speak, right, unless, you know, unless we automatically know it's coming from, you know, I'm, I'm trying to inform someone, right, but if it's just that casual chit-chatting or texting or whatever, just ask yourself first, like, is what I'm about to say rooted in my eye or on my eye? And I get, you know, now you have things to really um, measure that answer up against, right? You have this filter that you can use. So knowing the real reason and drive behind what we want to say before we say it, right? It's very important. Excuse me. Before we say it requires unadulterated self-reflection. And if we just take a few seconds, right, to do that, a lot of things that we're going to say, we probably won't even say it. And this is important too, including jokes, right? Is the joke being used to convey a hidden feeling? A lot of people use jokes to do that. Um, that's why that we all are familiar with that saying, um, there's a little truth in every joke. So, you know, a lot of people like to say, I was just joking, I was just joking. Yeah, make sure that you really understand the true basis of your joke. And is your joke coming from a place or premise of ma'at or one of these um, reasons uh, in alignment with an ma'at? So I will end with in that precept in the words of the young people. I, I love this saying that they say, say less. <laughs> Um, and that will help us, uh, you know, create more sociably harmonious, uh, you know, relationships in societies. All right, precept 33. And which is not a no out or out T is sin or sinful. And so the sin, this construct of sin or sinful is essentially an immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law. And, you know, I, I'm sure there's going to be people that want to argue this, what is divine law and all that. So for the sake of this <laughs> talk, the divine law is going to um, encompass these 42 precepts. All right. Maybe on another platform, I'll get into that discussion a little bit more. Um, but even if you listen to the first talk in this series. I kind of like really got into this construct of divine law. But for this precept, we're just talking about these precepts. Um, and also the construct, the idea of doing things that's going to have a positive outcome, right? That's my eye. Um, so even if that precept hasn't been carved out or written out, we kind of like know what's right or wrong or what can be classified as sin or sinful. And so that's, this precept is kind of like speaking to that. Ah, and no, right? Ah, I, I, me, no, not. Adi or Ari is do commit cause, right? It's, it's that concept of making something happen, doing something, engaging. Ah, I, I, me, bend, wickedness, evil, wretchedness. So this precept has like, it's like a two, two and one, because normally you only see, I will not one time, but this is kind of like, 
really bringing it home, right? With this sinful, wicked, evil acts. And so I translate this as I will not commit sinful and moral acts of transgression against divine law. I will not commit evil, wicked, or wretched acts. And I, I, I like this precept because I call it the wide net casting precept. <laughs> this is the precept that um, just in case something else didn't quite get in here or, you know, because they say it's been worded down from, uh, you know, different numbers, 77, 144, you know, all of these different numbers. So just in case something got missed, I call that the wide catching precept. So you know if it's if it's wretched or wicked or evil or on my eye. And so that precept is saying, I won't do it. I won't even do that. <laughs> All right, precept 34. And Adi, which we know is do, commit, cause, etc. Ah, I, me, shenti illness, sickness, incantations, right? Incantations is is witchcraft, right? Hoodoo, voodoo, all that stuff, curses, spells, you know, those things that a lot of people are trying to get into today because they think it it, it, it equates to spiritual power. Sutin, king, queen. So that translates to I will not or have not caused, so I really have, I will not cause illness, sickness, or curses on or to the king or queen. And so I have put those asterisk marks um, because I mentioned in a previous talk that at the end, um, I'm going to modify some of the precepts that are outdated. And so this is one of them because we, you know, this doesn't apply anymore, <laughs> right? But, you know, at the time it was written, I'm sure it was definitely um, feasible, right? Because you had people that would um, conjure up and do things uh, to, to cause illness, sickness, or death to the king or the queen. I mean, I, I like watching timepieces. And so during the Victorian era, people would put poison in the king's food or, you know, queen's food. So... This was definitely a precept that was uh, needed for that time. But um, it, it, it's not just a practical precept. It's, it's a precept that speaks to a higher understanding within ancient Kemet in the, in the society. And I like this particular quote because it helps us to understand that precept. The sky is at peace, the earth is in joy. For they have heard that Pharaoh Nefakare will set Ma'at in the place of Isfet. Right? That's from the pyramid text. And this captures the fact that the, the, the spirit, the leaders of ancient Kemet were spiritually moral people. They actually went through the transformation purification process to the point that they were able to rule as um, leaders standing in and in, 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 on the foundation of Ma'at. And so when that happens, you know, your pe people will write things like this. The sky is at peace, the earth is in joy, for they have heard that the leader, the king or queen, right, who, the leader will set Ma'at in the place of Isfet, in the place of chaos and confusion. So we don't have that today. And so that's why we have Isfet in the place of Ma'at and we are trying to, right? There's a need to begin changing that. All right. And so that is a precept that I will tweak and modify a little bit. Um, and, and I'll, again, I'll reveal that next week or not next week, <laughs> during the next talk. All right, precept 35. And no, not a hen or a hen, wave or rest upon. Ah, I, me, 
Okay, on, upon, or through. Mo or more waters. So this is an interesting precept, right? If you just take it, and I sat with it for a while, and you know, I couldn't see any further into this. I will not wade in the waters. Um, and so I've seen other translations as just that I will not wade in the water. Um, and then I've seen renditions that kind of like, uh, I guess, give it some more meaning by saying, I will not pollute the waters. So I could possibly pollute the waters. Um, nothing else came through to me. So I, I'm, I'll keep it as that, possibly pollute the waters. And I say that because when you think about wading in the water, it's simply walking in the water, getting in the water with your body, right? That's even the, you know the feet there, which help to create this word. And hence this implication of you know, you know taking your feet someplace. And so when I think about wading in the water, I mean we had uh, old uh, religious uh, song wading in the water, right? I don't really know how to interpret that as something that is um, negative or something that is um, problematic or goes against my eye, you know, just by just getting in the water, swimming in the water, uh, you know, I, unless it's like um, a special body of water, right? If it's, if it's the uh, reservoir that people need <laughs> to drink from, yeah, you don't want to get in that, which you're just walking in that and putting your body in that. So maybe that's why um, it was also, uh, I guess, consider maybe polluting the water. So it's up to, you know, I guess it's up to the person. I, I think I like polluting the water as well. But again, there may be a whole deep meaning to this that we just haven't been able to discover. Um, but I wanted to present it in its purest uh, way. So here we have it. So that was our final precept for tonight, and um, very straightforward. I did want to talk about some upcoming events that um, I will be hosting. So Arat Ra Kometic Reiki, we will finally be doing our class in Houston. I always do one a year, and um, I had to put off the other the class early this year. It's just been a lot of other good things going on. So we have it on the calendar for October 30th. And um, so if you're in the, in the Houston area or you want to travel to Houston and uh, learn the, the, the wonderful ancient comedic art of self-healing, this class is coming up October 30th. It's an all-day class. Um, I call it a boot camp. You get all the tools that you need to really um, put your healing uh, work and practice in a structured form, right? My eye is also about structure. And a lot of people um, are wanting to evolve spiritually, but they can't find the structure because, you know, there's just so much out there now. This class will help give you that structure that will help you continue to move forward on your spiritual journey. Then we have... Um, the winter solstice comedic spiritual retreat. This is actually a pre winter solstice. This is, this retreat is going to really prepare you for that heightened time of year. And if you haven't seen my talk on the winter solstice, please go ahead and watch that. And that will help you understand why this time of year is spiritually heightened. So this retreat is going to be also in uh, Texas, uh, in Hempstead, Texas. And it's going to be a fabulous retreat. The theme is Think Like a SAR, Mastering Positive Thinking and Manifestation. Um, I'm excited. Um, we're going to do Smatawi um, Yoga, right? That is the movement of the gods and goddesses or the Neturu. So it's a very um, spiritual form of comedic yoga. It's very ancient. It's the one that goes back <laughs> to the walls of Kemet. Um, we're also going to do uh, Reiki sessions and, and group healing sessions. We'll be using 
from comedic energies. So we we work with the comedic energies, and that and, and that's it. Um, and we go and work with the agreeable comedic energies. <laughs> so it's going to be a very spiritually heightened uh, atmosphere. Um, we're going to have comedic diet uh, based food, so it will be plant based, mostly live. Um, healing rituals, we will have silent reflection time, guided meditations, comedic lesson teachings, and a whole lot more. So space is limited. Uh, we want to keep the uh, conference, you know, to a certain number of people. So if you're interested, don't hesitate to register or um, reach out for more information. Uh, we have a phenomenal rate of um, three nights that includes everything, um, which is, like I said, in, is extremely uh, cost effective, especially in this economic climate. But uh, you have to pay before 11, 11, I mean, 11, 1, November 1st, and then after that, it's six ninety nine. So um, if you want to join us this year as we uh, get ready to uh, master positive thinking and manifestation so that we can help create a prosperous uh, 2023 uh, for ourselves. Don't hesitate to reach out. And with that being said, do a lot of adorations to the divine in you for watching. Also, I want to send you Mer Aki Hatep. That is love. And I'm talking about divine love joy and peace hopefully i will see you in two weeks when we wrap up this talk on my art and we conclude the 42 precepts of my art. Hatep.